You're watching This Week in Louisiana Politics with Fred Childers. Good morning, I'm Shannon Hack. Thanks for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Politics on your local election headquarters. The State Gaming Control Board approved yet another fantasy sports betting license and approved the catalog that lays out what leagues you can bet on once real life sports betting begins. It's not clear when the sports betting licenses will be approved for the casinos and bars that have applied, but there have been 13 applicants. The catalog lays out rules of the kinds of leagues you can bet on. No high school sports, but college and national teams are fair game. As other licensees wish to uh, add additional events or sports to the state for possible wagering, they'll have a process where they submit that to the board. The state patrol has to investigate the companies that apply for sports betting licenses to make sure they won't be a major risk to the state. To offer online betting, they must have a brick and mortar casino, bar, or other business. We're, we're working through a process right now for the for the in-house uh, 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 licensing, uh, as you know, that's going to come first. The board did, however, approve the second fantasy sports betting license. This is where people can draft made-up teams on an app to win points over a sports season. FanDuel will be coming to Louisiana and expects to make millions in the state. It's just a, a aspect of getting the regulatory approvals in all the jurisdictions and getting them up and running. FanDuel already operates in 46 other states. Days after a second arrest for drinking and driving, New Orleans City Councilman Jared Brosset says that he is not stepping down, but he is stepping away from his duties as a council member to seek treatment for alcoholism. In a statement, Brosset writes, addiction is an illness. It's not a choice. For me, my family, and those I serve, I must prioritize rehabilitation. In June of 2020, he crashed a city lease SUV on Elysian Fields and then failed a sobriety test. Brissette is also a candidate for a council member at large in the November 13th election, but he said he will be suspending all camp campaign activities. And in the wake of Hurricane Ida, the state insurance commissioner is launching a mediation program to help home homeowners get a better shot at a fair deal with their insurance companies, but there are some limitations. For $600, a mediator will take the evidence from both sides to help conclude how much should be paid out. That cost should fall on the insurance company, according to the insurance commissioner. But if they refuse, it would be on the policyholder. This is a voluntary program, unlike after Hurricane Katrina. And I am confident this new mediation program will be very helpful in solving claim disputes between insurers and their policyholders and getting people what they need to put their homes and lives back in order. The mediation meetings will take place in Baton Rouge or New Orleans, but a virtual option is being considered for those outside the metro area. For people with over $50,000, Donilon says that that will take longer than the 90 minutes these mediators have agreed to. But he encourages those people to file a complaint with his office if there is an issue. If they don't resolve that claim uh, to the satisfaction of their policyholder, ultimately there will be litigation. The decision made by the mediator is not legally binding. Well, the state legislature is still looking for answers about why electricity and communication services failed after Hurricane Ida. Senator Rick Ward chairs the Senate Commerce Committee, and he says the state will be looking at how companies like Entergy could harden the grid without charging their customers. What are you doing, you know, if you end up having $40 in surcharges because you had four hurricanes in the course of three or four years? But there's a balancing act, you know, if you... If you, if you spend too much money in trying to, to build it to sustain something that doesn't happen too frequently, then that can also make the cost not sustainable. Ward says more focus needs to be put on building a stronger grid and replacing crumbling roads and bridges. And due to that scrutiny, utility companies are now upgrading their infrastructure to ensure a stronger grid. AT&T has already started burying more fiber optic lines, and Entergy is now replacing hundreds of poles in the capital area. Both face serious public pressure to improve their systems after Hurricane Ida wiped out services for a large portion of their customers. Entergy says that these new upgrades can quickly restore power after daily faults like fallen tree limbs or a tripped breaker. 
And the Secretary of State is reminding voters the 2021 elections are fast approaching. The deadline for absentee ballots for the November 13th election is November 9th. Early voting for that election will begin on October 30th and last through November 6th. And several polling locations have been moved due to Hurricane Ida damage. And you can find out where you need to vote by going to the Secretary of State website. And Louisiana voters will have to decide how they feel about the four constitutional amendments. I broke down what Amendment 1 would mean for Louisiana. Louisiana is one of few states that collects sales taxes on the local level. Those who support a centralized system say it would clear up any red tape and make the state a more attractive place to do business. Traditionally, there's been a, a spider web of collectors. There's over 55 different collectors in Louisiana. So if you're a small business, it can be very cumbersome. It can be very expensive. The Louisiana Association of Business and Industry supports Constitutional Amendment 1, saying the current system is too complex. For those against it, there is concern that it will take control away from local government who argue they know their tax system best. But that's going to be the real challenge with this amendment is how do you have a uniform system that protects local governments, um, their ability to retain the money that they are owed from sales tax collection, but also make it easier for businesses. If the amendment passes, it would create an appointed eight-member commission. There are four appointees by the state and four appointees by local collectors, and so it's a balanced approach. If it passes next session, there'll be a statutory bill passed to put kind of the rules and regulations around it. The LA budget project has not taken an official stance on the amendment. Currently, we don't have any clue who this commission will be, how it will operate, uh, because the governing legislation has not been passed just yet. One key note about this amendment is that it will not change tax rates. Only the way they are collected would change. Well, coming up, the latest on the January 6th investigation, and one Louisiana senator is trying a new tactic to bring money for hurricane relief. Stick with us. We'll be right back. This is your local election headquarters. Welcome back. Lawmakers on Capitol Hill voted to hold former President Donald Trump's ally Steve Bannon in contempt of Congress. This comes after Bannon denied appearing before the committee investigating the attack on January 6th. Washington correspondent Kelly Meyer explains what happens next. Good morning. This all now moves to the Department of Justice, who will decide whether to prosecute. It's all creating another divide here in Congress, even among members of the same party. The yeas are 229, the nays are 202. Nine House Republicans voted with all Democrats to hold Steve Bannon in contempt. Steve Bannon has led us down this path. Mississippi Democrat Benny Thompson called for the committee vote, referring Bannon for criminal contempt after he declined to cooperate with the panel investigating the January 6th attack at the U.S. Capitol. What sort of precedent would it set for the House of Representatives if we allow a witness to ignore us flat out without facing any kind of consequences. Those consequences could mean jail time, but it's up to the Department of Justice to decide whether to prosecute. The Department of Justice will do what it always does in such circumstances. It will apply the facts and the law and make a decision consistent with the principles of prosecution. Bannon says he can't cooperate with the committee because the documents the panel wants are protected by executive privilege and it's up to the courts to resolve it. We believe Mr. Bannon has information valuable to our probe. Most Republicans stand against the effort. Issuing invalid subpoena weakens our power, not if somebody votes against it. Garland says the Department of Justice would review any referral but won't say when that referral may be shared. Reporting in Washington, I'm Kelly Meyer. None of the Louisiana Republican House members voted to hold Bannon in contempt, and Democrats voted down party lines along with those nine Republicans. In an interview this week, Senator Bill Cassidy said he would not vote for Donald Trump if he runs for president again, and he also hinted he doesn't believe he would win the nomination. Niels Rang breaks down the senator's statements. They love this state. They love this country. Senator Bill Cassidy. This is Trump country. What's changed between then and now? Clearly what's changed is President Trump's behavior after the election. 
Cinderbell Cassidy is not afraid to stand alone, as seen in the January impeachment trial, where he was one of seven Republican senators who voted to convict Trump of inciting an insurrection. For that, the Republican Party of Louisiana publicly censored him. Now Cassidy is saying he will not vote for President Trump in 2024. All my comments have been, how do we win elections going forward? When Trump was elected, Republicans had control of the presidency, the Senate, and the House of Representatives. But Cassidy is quick to point out all have since swayed to the Democrats. The last time that happened was in the Great Depression. We had great policies. I supported President Trump's policies. But after he lost in November of last year and went to Georgia and basically told people not to show up, and we've lost that those races, now we've lost the Senate. Losing that presidency, the House and the Senate in four years hasn't happened since Herbert Hoover. Monday, former President Trump lashed out in a statement saying wacky Bill can't walk down the street in Louisiana. The great people curse him. Cassidy suggests if voters want to win the presidency, Trump's historic loss may not make him the best nominee, at least not for Bill Cassidy. You gotta win elections. You gotta win elections. And if you don't win elections, you end up with the mess we have now. A bill co-sponsored by Senator John Kennedy would allow states to spend American Rescue Act money on disaster relief, and it passed the Senate this week. Senator Kennedy says Louisiana has gone through historic hurricanes and storms over the last year and a half, and Louisiana has already allocated about $1.5 billion for COVID relief and are set to allocate another $1.5 billion in the 2022 legislative session. What we did was basically take the handcuffs off. So uh, the, the bottom line is of the $4.8 uh, billion dollars that we sent this year to Louisiana state government, uh, our legislature can use 30% of that money for infrastructure and use 100% of that money if it wishes for disaster relief. The bill now waits for a vote in the House before it could be sent to the president's desk. And after the break, we hear from Congressman Garrett Graves about that bill and more. This is your local election headquarters. Welcome back. We're joined by Congressman Garrett Graves this morning. Congressman, thank you so much for being with us today. You bet. Great to be with you. Well, you had a great announcement today where the loans for three fire districts here in the Baton Rouge area are going to be forgiven. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, so dating back to the 2016 flood in the immediate aftermath, as you know, our firefighters and first responders were out there working 24 hours a day, doing rescues, providing first response services to people all across the, the capital region. And, and that costs a lot of money. It costs a lot of overtime, the boats, the rescue equipment. And so the fire departments had to go out and secure emergency loans from FEMA in order to continue providing those operations. Uh, we have had loans totaling millions of dollars across our communities uh, that have been burdening these fire departments and preventing them from being able to get uh, new equipment, training, uh, technology. And so we've been working with them now for several months and we're, we're recently able to get a provision in the law that's going to permanently forgive those loans and allow uh, our fire departments to focus on things that we wanted to focus on. And that funding came through the stopgap funding bill that kept our government funded through December. So how did that come to be to get in on that legislation? Well, so as you know, we, we had been pushing really hard to include in that bill some Hurricane Ida recovery funds, some of the initial recovery funds to get money to those people whose homes were destroyed or homes damaged. And so we already had kind of a, a FEMA and disaster recovery component. We started working on other provisions to help improve the efficiency of recovery. That is one of the things that we've had on our list for uh, uh, several months now. And so as we were working through things, we had we, we were trying to get different things in, and some of them we were able to get in, some of them we weren't. But um, the good news on this one is that there's a little bit kind of larger constituency. This ended up helping some communities in Texas, in Puerto Rico, in Virgin Islands, uh, Florida. So we had a, a little bit larger coalition of folks that we were working with on getting this one done. And we're going to have to revisit the funding of the government in December, and there have been some talks of further relief aid. Have you heard anything else on that, or are you going to be pushing for that yourself? 
Uh, we are going to be pushing forward. So as you know, in, in that stopgap funding bill, we were able to include $1 billion in Hurricane Ida direct assistance to uh, hurricane victims. We we're able to provide $600 million for hurricane victims from Laura, Delta, and Zeta, where we uh, uh, included about $2 billion in new flood protection and waterways investments in South Louisiana. So what we're doing now is we're kind of looking at those dollars, how they're absorbed, trying to get a little bit better measure on what the needs are. As you know, when we did it the first time, we were only about three weeks in when we were quantifying the numbers. And so it was it was, um, you know, we had some rough estimates on what the needs were going to be. We knew it was going to be more than a billion. So we're trying to get a little bit better measure on what the additional recovery needs are. Uh, so just to be clear, we are absolutely going to be pushing for some more recovery dollars in this next appropriations bill. Yeah, so speaking of hurricane recovery, Senator John Kennedy just passed a bill in the Senate that would allow states to use some of their American Rescue Act dollars towards disaster relief. And I know we still have over $1 billion here in Louisiana to dole out. So are you in support of a bill like that? Um, as a matter of fact, you look, the state of Louisiana received like $5 billion, which is nearly half of the state's annual operating budget. This is a lot of money between the state and the parishes. Uh, we had actually offered an amendment uh, earlier this year trying to provide more flexibility uh, to allow these dollars to be used <clears throat> uh, to allow these dollars to be used for transportation projects, flood protection and other government priorities fully in support of what Senator Kennedy is doing and it's consistent with some of our efforts from months ago. Right, and there's still a lot of talks around the infrastructure bills, both the bipartisan and the Build Back Better bill. So, you know, in the House, what are you hearing? What are the talks still? It seems like we've gotten a little quiet as, uh, as the talks with the president have been kind of going on behind closed doors. Well, look, there's some, there's some really uh, challenging negotiating conditions that are out there. Uh, I think it's what happens when you have such a tight margin. Unfortunately, uh, Speaker Pelosi, Senator Schumer, and President Biden have chosen to go in a unilateral partisan direction on this reconciliation bill. It is, uh, it is causing real challenges in negotiating. Secondly, they've chosen to link uh, an infrastructure bill with another bill to expand social welfare. They're refusing to consider those separately. If the infrastructure bill were considered as a standalone, they would have the votes in the House for that to pass and ultimately become law. It is because they are inextricably linking the social welfare expansion program uh, to the infrastructure bill is why they currently have problems. Uh, they continue to negotiate. Look, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I'm opposed to the social welfare expansion. I don't want to see that bill become law. I want to see us invest in real infrastructure solutions for Louisiana uh, as they sit there and continue to fight. I just told you a minute ago that we secured $2 billion in new flood protection projects in just the last month. And so we're going to continue working on getting real dollars out there for real infrastructure solutions and let these people have their political fights all day long. I know Nancy Pelosi put the deadline to the end of October to get those infrastructure bills done. Do you think that's going to happen? Um, I, look, I'll just say that that's the fourth deadline that she's put in place. Um, uh, I, I think that um, it is it is possible, but I think that if if they ultimately get to a vote by the end of the month, it's going to be, be because of one of two things. Either one, that they have cut back the social welfare expansion significantly dollar-wise, but also time-wise. I think they're going to probably try and exp expand social welfare programs for one year and then try and force Republicans to continue them beyond there. Um, or the other is that uh, she moves only with the infrastructure bill, which, of course, that one would be my preference. All right, Congressman, it looks like we're going to have a busy end of the year with all of these big bills coming up and funding our government. So anything else you'd like to add of what you're working on? Hey, look, I'll just say this. I know that there's a lot of political partisan fighting going on right now, and it's really frustrating when you have real needs, real problems in Louisiana and across this nation. So as people sit there and have their partisan fights, we're working on getting real things done. We're going to continue building upon the $2 billion infrastructure announcement we just made, continue building upon the $65 million in transportation funds that we just made, uh, that we just announced, and, and continue trying to work on real solutions while people sit there and have their fights in the background. All right, Congressman Garrett Graves, thank you so much for your time today. You bet. Thank you. Take care. We'll be right back. This is your local election headquarters.
Well, looking ahead to the coming week, Governor John Bell Edwards is expected to announce that the statewide mask mandate will expire on Tuesday. He is reviewing COVID data before making the decision. Also this week, redistricting meetings will take place in Lafayette and the public can share how they want to see the legislative districts redrawn. On Monday, the executive director of Parole Project will be at the Baton Rouge Press Club. He is expected to share how the organization helps people serving extreme sentences. Thank you for joining us for this week in Louisiana politics. I'm Shannon Hecht. Stay informed and be kind to each other. I'll see you next Sunday.